Hi everybody, my name is Laurent Cilia, I'm a graduate student in sociology at CU Boulder. I'm very honored, very happy today to share with you all uh, this little sequence of classes that I've developed um, at the end of the, the class Environment and Society, which I teach and, and I'm sure many of you have taught in the past. Um, I really want to say thank you to the organizers for putting together a creative um, conference uh, using technology to break the social norms and uh, the habits. Uh, I sure would have liked a little trip to the beach uh, and Santa Barbara, but that's the very problem I want to discuss uh, in my talk today. So this is how the talk is going to go. I'm going to briefly summarize um, the things that we typically do really well, I think, is uh, challenging, deconstructing uh, the idea of economic growth. Um, but then what I want to do that's maybe a little more uh, original is uh, talking about the commodification of happiness and how happiness has become something so profoundly materialistic and how when we start to deconstruct um, the construction of happiness, the commodification of happiness, we can start having an environmental conversation that connects uh, our way of life, our way of being well, and environmental problems. And then finally, to be even more concrete, I'll talk about voluntary simplicity before uh, addressing a few points about the things that, of course, I am not discussing in this presentation. So it's been almost 50 years since that first Earth Day, um, which is a sad, a sad commemoration. Um, today we don't have Barry Commoner anymore, but we do have Greta Thunberg, uh, who recently started a powerful movement uh, of youth against climate change. And just in case some of you are not aware of her name, uh, this is her speaking uh, a couple months back at the COP24 conference. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. I let you... Um, listen to the rest of her talk and her many talks. She's fantastic. Um, now, here's the question. Uh, how can we empower our students uh, after a class that brings bad news after bad news about the environmental um, systems we live in? So she just said, you only speak of green eternal economic growth because you're too scared of being unpopular. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing here today. 
is talking about alternatives to the big economic growth that we hear from the far left to the far right pretty much um, is the solution to all our problems. Uh, we're being told that trickle-down effect will uh, benefit the poor and will solve social inequality. We're being told that we need to generate more science and more money to fund science to fix environmental issues. But sociologists do a good job, have done a good job in the past deconstructing those uh, these myths. Uh, we, in those classes, typically look at the problems uh, related to GDP, the way GDP uh, measures things and what is measured and what is not accounted for in GDP. Um, we talk about the environmental Kuznets curve. We talk about the Netherlands fallacy. We study the Javans paradox. And really, we're pretty good, I think, at demonstrating that no, economic growth has not provided uh, peace and love in the world. Uh, indeed, economic, despite economic growth since the 70s, um, social inequality has only increased. And now we know, to come back to our main topic here, that with economic growth systematically comes uh, increased environmental degradation. And here we are. Every year we break the overshoot day earlier and earlier. And we've known for a long time now uh, that um, economic growth and environmental sustainability did not go together. Uh, in 1972, so only two years after the first Earth Day, um, the limits to growth um, demonstrated, put together the numbers uh, showing that um, population growth, economic growth, as long as growth was um, exponential uh, just could not work. Uh, we could not exponentially grow uh, forever on a finite planet. And the conclusions of the limits to growth were that we were on a trajectory to disaster and um, that it was necessary to uh, put together the conditions for economic and ecological stability, that the state of global equ equilibrium could be designed so that the basic material needs of each person uh, on Earth were satisfied and each person ha uh, would have an equal opportunity to realize their potential. But this had to happen outside of the only framework that was proposed to us, that is economic growth. Where we came up with, um, this is where we came up with this idea of sustainable development. And the problem with sustainable development is it is still based upon uh, the idea that the economy should grow. That in the top left quadrant of the Wren um, diagram, we still have job opportunity wealth creation, assuming that uh, those will come from economic growth. So here we are, faced with only one option, I think, is to actually talk about economic degrowth, to step out of this uh, model that is the only model that's ever been uh, presented to us. When the limits to growth uh, was just published, Nicolas, Nicolas Georgescu Rogan had just probably pu uh, published his book, um, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, in which he combined um, physics and uh, economics to make a profound statement about uh, economics. He concluded that based on the second law of entropy and the fact that energy is always lost in, uh, in any kind of manufacturing or transformation process, um, growth was not possible forever. Um, and therefore, he claimed that a steady state of economy or, as he coined it, degrowth was absolutely necessary in the long term. But things get really fun once I introduce the word degrowth in the class. Um, it typically 
opens up a world of excitement um, because at this point, students start to question absolutely everything. And so it's a process we go through together um, and we talk about our habits and consumptions and values and behaviors. And one by one, we can deconstruct, change, think about alternatives. Um, those are a few topics that we touch on, and I'm going to mostly focus on sobri sobriety now. But we can talk about production and exchange um, and how to do things uh, to recycle, to repair, to do things outside of the consumer market. Uh, we talk about production and um, so generation and consumption of energy. Uh, we talk, uh, we go in depth into the topic of localization. What is local? Um, how to make things local? Um, but for now, I'm mostly going to talk about sobriety. And the topic of uh, degrowth by itself could um, definitely fill up a whole semester. It would be an... So since um, growth is predicated upon um, the treadmill of production and, the, and therefore the treadmill of consumption, um, at this point, it's time to uh, tackle the beast of materialism. Um, and students really, really enjoy those kind of conversations. We talk about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivations and drives, drivers in, in life. Uh, we talk about what makes them happy, uh, how they project in the future, and how they think they can measure someone's uh, success. And there's lots of uh, social psychology work out there that shows that actually when people have um, more uh, strong materialistic value, um, and so they, therefore they pursue financial success and have not, they want to have nice possessions. They, have, they focus on the right image and status. Um, then they are more likely to be disappointed and to be frustrated and to be unsatisfied and unhappy. Indeed, we know that um, the levels of happiness do not correlate with um, the average income. Lots of studies have shown that um, beyond um, a minimum level of income, once uh, basic needs are met, uh, people do not describe being more, any more happy. Amazing class. Um, and here is where I really dive into the, the fun topic of happiness and the social construction of happiness. Um, we don't lack opportunities and examples to... Um, demonstrate and teach the concept of social construction in sociology. Um, but this one is a fantastic one because it's something uh, we can all talk about. Um, it'd be something along the A very brief um, search on the internet shows that happiness is absolutely everywhere in the most absurd commercials. Everything's supposed to be happy from that woman in the middle selling a, a water bottle. Uh, to the McDonald's meal or the car. Everything is about to be happy. There's also the countless pages of um, books about happiness on Amazon. Um, but a piece the student really enjoy typically is the uh, Juliet Shaw piece, uh, Keeping Up with the Trumps, in which she describes that um, when one is driven by materialistic values, then one's happiness is uh, limited and framed by how much their neighbor and their um, social environment owns. So at this point, it becomes clear for the student that happiness, which is a physiological state, there are hormones involved in it, um, is something that is heavily conditioned by society and social norms and advertisements. And, um, 
And when it comes to the impact of advertisement, I encourage you all to, if you don't know it, to watch um, this BBC documentary, The Century of Self. And in the first part of The Century of Self, uh, Edward Bernays is, is portrayed and he's uh, broadly considered uh, the founder of PR. And in that documentary, they describe really well the impact that advertisements, commercials can have on people's uh, psyche and where this drive to buy and to consume um, comes from. Yet we know that um, because of the hedonic treadmill, the adaptation uh, to consumption and the fact that the, um, the social environment environment is so important in determining um, how we feel about ourselves when we are driven by materialistic values, we know that actually what makes people happy is not stuff. Uh, what actually intrinsically, deeply makes people happy are um, family relationship and financial situation, sure, stability work but mostly how meaningful work is and then community and friends and we're back to the same point family relationship and then health and then personal freedom and personal values those are things that one cannot buy um but once we realize that um happiness is not necessarily founded on materialistic values on stuff and one does not need to own more stuff to be happy then we can start thinking about not using stuff not buying stuff and yet being happy and this is where i make the connection between uh, environmental sustainability and happiness and degrowth and this is where the magic happens really when one understands that um, by moving away from materialistic value, uh, we're more likely to be happy and at the same time to um, have a much lower environmental footprint. <clears throat> now, let me briefly introduce you to this young man. Um, Thomas was a student of mine when I started teaching elementary school. Um, and he's now 23. This summer, Thomas was supposed to come visit us in uh, Colorado until he played around with um, a calculator, an environmental footprint calculator, and realized that one single trip across the ocean would double his um, CO2 emissions for the year. And at that point, Thomas made a bold, very courageous, and totally unexpected move and decided to let me know that actually he felt too bad about it and would not fly over the ocean. He did not make that decision because uh, it was too expensive, because he could not afford it. Thomas is, is financially stable at this point and he could come see us and he has in the past, but he decided to back off. He decided to not take a vacation because he did not need it. And this is the point of voluntary simplicity. Uh, probably all of us here um, listening to this video have more, um, have a greater environmental impact that a lot of people in developing countries do. And we, it's on us to make the decision to lower our environmental footprint. So how can we do that? What Eric Olin Wright used. A few solutions are uh, I like to play around with um, in class is uh, transportation. Whether you decide to not fly over the ocean or you, um, as an adult, decide to uh, travel across New York City on a scooter. Um, not expected from uh, an adult with a full salary. And yet, that's a decision, that's an option you can make. Another um topic I love to discuss is um, housing. So whether you decide purposefully to downscale the size of your house and you, you go on purpose for a tiny house, or even maybe even better, you purposefully seek, you actively seek uh, a co-housing situation, um, you have a great uh, impact on uh, your environmental footprint in when you make this kind of decision 
and you live closer to people and you secure social bonds. And finally, there is a, another point that is, that is extremely empowering and lowering our environmental footprint, and that is um, eating a plant-based diet. I did not make up a slide for that. It's simple enough. Um, so to conclude, because I run out of time, um, I know I have not addressed a lot of topics. I have not talked about the government, about the role of protection uh, environmental uh, agencies. I have not talked about social movements. Um, but all those things we discuss through uh, the semester, and what I find is um, the students are really um, grasped by this topic of questioning what actually makes them happy, what they need, what they don't need. Um, it's actually very trendy currently because uh, Marie Kondo has a Netflix show on uh, teething your house, getting rid of stuff. There are several blogs and books about minimalism. There's a fantastic read on uh, digital minimalism by Carl Newport that I'm going to put in the references that uh, talks about also the dangers of uh, the new technologies and the attention economy. Um, and so I think just having this conversation gives the students a tool to leave the classroom and actually do something right away. I know some will uh, consider that this is a very neoliberal way to uh, address environmental issues because it's focused on individuals uh, and it is not addressing the larger uh, structures, the economy, the government. Um, but those things I discuss, it doesn't mean those are not mutually exclusive. And I think the question of minimalism and this power we have to make the choice to not fly to Santa Cruz, uh, to Santa Barbara to do a conference or to not fly across the ocean to uh, see a friend um, is extremely important and extremely helpful because otherwise we're left with the same behaviors that we had 50 years ago and we're left wondering oh, how come we haven't made any progress since the first Earth Day? Because it's on us, on every single one of us. Uh, it's on Finland and Sweden and the tiny countries and every one of us to actually make those decisions. Um, so thanks a lot for um, listening to this talk. If you made it all the way here, I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments and uh, sharing resources. The next slide will be a long uh, list of references. Thanks again. Do um, with his seminars on uh, utopia and how to think beyond capitalism. And so, for instance, this is just a list of topics that was shared by me uh, to me by Ryan Gunderson, um, who has a book coming uh, soon um, on the topic of degrowth, and that will be in the references.